from the book of Matthew, in chapter 10, verse 22. Part B of that verse. Very familiar passage here that we quote most often, the latter part of that verse. But Jesus Christ here speaking says, But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. If you want to be able to say it's well with my soul, as we just heard the song, you're going to have to make it to the end. Oh, it's well this morning with my soul, but what about when my soul faces eternity? Now listen, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Are you thankful for salvation this morning? He shall be saved. Saved from what? Listen, from the wrath of God. Amen? From hell. Saved from the lake of fire. Saved from eternal punishment. For the wicked, for throughout all eternity, I'm thankful to be saved, aren't you? What are we saved for in exchange for heaven? Amen. Heaven, uh, the everlasting joy, peace, life eternal around the throne of God, worshiping God throughout all eternity. We're talking about salvation this morning. He that endures to the end shall be saved. I want to be saved, don't you? I thank God I am saved this morning. But one day, throughout all eternity, I can enjoy the blessing of salvation, not just here on this earth. I enjoy salvation here. But one day, salvation will be complete. I will enjoy the joys of heaven throughout all eternity. Hear the promise of the hope of salvation. Aren't you glad we have that promise today? The the promise of salvation. He that endures to the end shall be saved. This salvation comes only by Jesus Christ. Amen. The word tells us There is no other name under heaven given whereby we must be saved. But the wonderful name of Jesus, that's the only way. Only through the sacrificial blood of the Lamb of God. Amen. Romans 5, 8 and 9 tells us, But God commendeth His love toward us, In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can you say thank you, Lord? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Jesus. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Thank God for the promise of the hope of salvation. That while I was yet a sinner, the Lamb of God came and died for me. That I might miss the wrath of God. That I might find salvation in Him. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The devil, hell was made for the devil and his angels. It was never intended for you to go there. There has been an avenue made that we can miss hell. It's called salvation. That that we can find hope that we don't have to go to that awful place of torments, gnashing of teeth, weeping, wailing, you know. But we can find salvation. 
God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. This wonderful promise of salvation is extended to all men. Amen? All men. Paul said in Romans 5 and 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. How many likes gifts? I love gifts. If you, if you want to see somebody smile, bring me a gift. I'll smile for you. A free gift, Brother Carver, has been given to us to all men. Why? Because one man paid the price. The Lamb of God, the only begotten Son of God, suffered the price that we might receive the gift. The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. We can have eternal life. When, we, when this world is over, we've got one here this morning approaching 100 years old. <laughs> huh? Oh, it would be sad to think 100 years of living, and that's all. What are you going to do then? Die? But that's not the end of it. <laughs> Why? Because we have life. <laughs> we have eternal life promised to us. Well, there'll be no more dying. Amen. There'll be no more crying. There, the Lord said he wiped every tear out of our eyes. Yes, Who would not, in their right mind, want to take part of salvation? Amen. Who would not want to enjoy eternal life? It's been given to us, a free gift. I had a, a friend, a dear friend of mine, Show up to my house one day. He called. He was on his way. He said, you at home? I said, yeah. I want to stop by and see you. I said, okay. He came. He pulled up. He come to the door. He was real jittery. Knocked on the door. Sort of unlike him. Most of the time he would come on in. I come, he wanted me to come to the door. I came to the door. He said, come, come on out here. I didn't know what was going on. So I walked outside and we walked over to his car. He raised the trunk. He gave me something that was very precious to me. Number one, because uh, he gave it to me. But it was something that he knew that I really liked. And he was trying to be encouraging to me. And he showed me through his love, through a gift. It was an old guitar and an amplifier. You know, he, he said, I, 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 I've seen this and i thought about you and I just want you to have it. And it just melted my heart because it, he gave it to me. It was free. It wasn't the value of the, of the gift, but it was because he cared enough and he wanted me to have it. A free gift. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has offered us a free gift of life. <laughs> oh, who in the right mind would not want to rejoice over that? A free gift of life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Chapter 10 and verse 13 there in Romans says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, man. You mean anyone? The Word of God says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Anyone. No matter what your name is, what color you are, what country you're from, what language you speak, anyone, anywhere can be saved can be a recipient of the free gift of life. There are people who are waiting 
I saw a very sad story the other day. There was a man, he was, he was on the list to receive, uh, I can't remember what, which, which organ it was, but he was dying. Uh, kidneys, I believe. And, and, and he, he was about at death's door, but he was on a list to receive a kidney transplant. And they was just re- waiting for the right donor and when the, for, the, for everything to line up that, that, would, that would be a, 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 an acceptable uh, donor for him. He got a call. He said, we have a donor. Well, just a few days before that, his son was in a terrible car. That's a deal. <laughs> and it took his life. But he was a donor. And he was a perfect fit for his father to receive his kidneys and, return, and continue living. Oh, the precious gift of life. Does, does life mean more to you now? Huh? To, to think that I could continue living because my son had died? What would life mean to me then? How precious would it mean? Listen, the Son of God, the the spotless Lamb, laid down His life. No greater love than this for no man. He laid down His life to offer us the free gift of life. (laughs) That we might live eternally in the joys of heaven. Why? Only because He loved us. Only because he wanted to give us something. Huh? Thank you, Jesus. So no matter who you are, whosoever will, the call on his name shall be saved. You mean little old me? I was born a nothing and a nobody. I had no hope in this life of ever obtaining very much at all. But yet I can have eternal life. Yes, even you, even I, even the pauper of this world can be a recipient of life. Why? Because Jesus loves you. Why? Because he laid down his life. Let's go on. Back to our opening scripture here, Matthew 10 and 22. But he that endureth to the end, shall be saved. Let's slow down a little bit. Jesus said, but he that endureth. Wait a minute. Uh Uh-oh. We just heard a beautiful message of free life given to us. Haven't we? How many is a recipient of that that free gift? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. But listen what Jesus says. But he that endureth. Uh oh. Now wait a minute. You mean I've I've got now I've got to do something? Yeah. So we're listening to Jesus' words now. The giver of life. Listen to what he says, but he that endureth. You you mean you mean now something I've I've got to do something to maintain? my salvation? Uh Uh-huh. Yes, I'm afraid so. You mean there's requirements to salvation? Yes, there is. You mean there there are conditions, there's responsibilities on my part? You know what good that guitar and amplifier would do me if I said, oh, that's pretty, and never picked it up? I'd never experience the fullness of the gift. I never have the full joy of playing the instrument. But says, but he that endureth. Have you ever heard these words? I want to quote you some words of a very famous person. See if you've ever heard these words. Go and sin no more. You ever heard those words? How many knows who I'm quoting? Jesus said, go and sin no more. You mean something is required after I receive the gift, the free gift of eternal life, now I've got to do something with it? 
Yes. Afraid so. Romans 10 and 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, now, the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Let's slow down and read this. Romans 10 and 9. That if, we can stop right there. <laughs> this little word if, we've heard it preached every which way, upside down, backwards, forwards, inside out. If. If is not a noun, it's not a verb, it's not an adjective. If is what they call a conjunction. The word means it's conditional. When you see the word if in a statement or in a sentence, you immediately understand there are conditions abiding here. If. But stronger than that is a conjunction. And what that means in the English language is it ties things together. It brings this part with this part to bring it all together to show you the conditions. That if thou shalt confess, oh, there's one condition. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now you know a lot of people think that's all there is to salvation. Well, the word of God tells us there's a whole lot more to it than that. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and there's something else that's got to be tied to that and shalt believe in thy heart. If thou wilt, shalt confess with thy mouth and believe with thine heart, in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You mean there's more to it than just lip service? You mean there's more required than me just saying, Jesus, I'm saved. There's more to it. There was a movement going on a few years ago that it was a deceptive movement in the religious world. That people were teaching other people in the altar that all you've got to do is repeat after me. You say, I'm going to tell you what to say. You say these words and you can be saved. That's a lie from the pits of hell. The word of God says, yes, you, you confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart. <laughs> you, uh, there ain't nobody can tell you nothing to repeat to cause you to believe in your heart. No, that's something between you and God. And only the spirit of God can draw that heart and cause you to want to believe and to believe. No, it's more than just repeat after me. There's conditions in salvation. Amen? James 1 and 21. Let's listen to what James says. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. When you come to an altar of repentance, you've got to lay something down. There's a sad case of souls in the world today who believe that they can casually walk up. A few weeks ago, we had a man come into this church Early before most of us was here, he sat here for a pretty good while waiting for service to start. Service started, we had prayer and gave opportunity to anoint anyone who needed, wanted prayer for their bodies. He came up and said, I want to be saved. I need to be saved. Problems in his life. 
Well, I talked to him just briefly here. You know, you put on the spot. You know what I'm saying? You, you, now you've got to deal with this situation right here, right now, right in front of everybody. <laughs> the very best of my knowledge and ability, I try to speak to him, to, to grasp in, in his heart. I feel like that never took root. He, he was under the influence that professing it with my mouth. You guys pray, and I'm going to walk away saved. Well, I haven't seen him back since that day. Let me tell you the danger of that. There's false security in that. There's false security in believing. All I got to do is say the name of Jesus, have some good saints around me pray, and I'm sealed. There's false security in that. Let me tell you something. The, the unspeakable gift of God, the free gift given to us because of the death of the Son of God must take place in your heart, not only your lips. Huh? There must be something to take place in your heart. But James said, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. You have to lay something down in order to receive the gift of salvation. There must be repentance. But that's not the end there either. James said, And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. You mean I've got to lay down my way of living? I, I've, I've got to come to an altar and lay it down and repent and get up and live a different lifestyle than I was living when I knelt down? Yes. You've got to lay down some things. But then Jim, James said, and you've got to be able to receive the engrafted Word of God, which is able to save your souls. There's conditions to eternal salvation. Yes, there is. Let's try our scripture again. Matthew 10 and 22. He that endureth unto the end... Oh, let's stop right there again. Oh, oh you mean... Listen. Listen. From the time of conversion until the time that breath leaves your body, you must maintain your salvation. Amen? From the time of conversion, he that endureth for a moment, he that it endureth until you get up from the altar, he that endureth through the night, no, he that endureth and to the end shall be saved. From the time of conversion, from the time that you are a recipient of the free gift of eternal life, then we must walk unto the end of this way and endure life and every hardship, every trial that comes with it, we must maintain our salvation. I had a conversation the other day. I'll share with you a story real quickly that blew my mind. This conversation was with a minister, two ministers actually. But they began talking about the love and mercy and grace of God. And the one said, he told me, I was raised the old-timey Pentecostal way. He's no longer walking in that way. But I was raised the old-timey Pentecostal way. My mother was strict. She raised us strict. We had strict living. And then he told me that he had this conversation with his mother the other day. Now he's a the theologian and, and he's, he's got all of this knowledge and he's a minister, been preaching 40 years. But now he's convinced that mama don't understand God. The old-fashioned, Pentecostal, holy way of living, now mama don't understand God. 
Listen, he says, I had a conversation with her the other day and said, Mama, now you've got to tell me something. If I'm out here working, hammering nails, and I hit my thumb with that hammer, and it causes me to blurt out a curse word, and at that very moment, the trumpet sounds and Jesus returns. He said, do you believe I will be lost? His mama said, yes, you will. Praise God for mama. But his way of thinking is, but she don't understand my God. Huh? Oh, God, help us. You, you see how important the message is this morning? You see how important... The, the, the little few words here that Jesus spoke, he that endureth to the end, not when we develop enough head knowledge that we're under the influence, the old-timey way isn't important anymore. They don't understand the grace of my God. That's a deceptive message. That's a message from Satan. And as he told me the story... You know, sometimes you, you, you respond without saying a word. I looked at him and my mouth was open. And I never said a word, but he got the message. And he started backpedaling and he changed the conversation. Oh, a minister, someone who is responsible for preaching and teaching souls the truth, now says you can curse at the very moment that the trumpet sounds and you'll still be saved. Jesus says, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. You'll not be saved by the buzzer, brother. You'll not be saved at, at the moment the trumpet sounds just because the trumpet sounds and we ain't got time for judgment now. No, it won't happen. You'll not be saved by the buzzer, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Look at Mark's account of Jesus' words here. Turn with me in Mark 13 and 13, the latter part of this verse. I want to bring out something special here if I can. Mark's account. He says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now there's a little bit of difference here. Mark heard something just a little bit different. Or for some reason, Matthew didn't include this or whatever. They can work that out with God. That ain't none of my business. But here, for no doubt, the Holy Ghost moved upon Mark to include this. He says, let's read it again. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same, say it with me, the same shall be saved. Wait a minute. What are we saying here? That's not very different than what we've already read. Well, yes, it is. Hallelujah. The word same, what does that mean? The definition of same, identical, the very one, indistinguishable, no other one. Uh-oh. No other one. Jesus here says the same shall be saved. What does that mean? No other one. I want you to look at something I've got here. Can anybody tell me what these are? Twenty two $20 bills. Do they look the same? They are the same yeah, they are. except for one thing. They're identical. They're exactly the same except for one thing, the serial number. This one right here, there is only one. I've got a rare $20 bill. There ain't but one in existence right here it is. You got one in your pocket? You probably got a rare one too. Why? Because there's a number on here that does not apply to any other one. Jesus said the same. There's no close. You, you may look the part, 
But he said, the same. Shall be. The same? What are you referring to? Let's go back here and see what he says. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. No other one, but he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. People say I'm saved and nothing can pluck me out of the hand of God. That's right. You ain't made it to heaven yet. He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now listen to this definition of the word same. In formal use, we all like to speak formal once in a while, don't we? Let's listen to this. In formal use or in legal use, if you've got a contract or uh, uh, some kind of legal document, you may see the word same there. You see it in legal use a lot. The, here it means the one just mentioned. That's simple. Anybody knows that. But when you look it up, it makes it so much more clear, don't it? The one just mentioned. The only one just mentioned. Jesus said, He that shall endure unto the end, the same, the one that I'm talking about, the one that's enduring, that one and that one only shall be saved. Don't take for granted your salvation. Don't treat it like any old kind of way and I've got a free ticket to glory. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Jesus said, this, He that endureth until the end, the same shall be saved. Only the one just mentioned, the one and only, only those who endure unto the end. Consider the 136th chapter of Psalms. Some people here may be their favorite chapter. We've heard some comments about it, but I want you to look at something. Let's look at the 136th chapter of Psalms. I'm going to try to read it right quick. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of our gods, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that stretches out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that smote Egypt and their firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever. I'm going to stop there. I think you get the point. The mercy of God endureth forever and forever. Now I want us to consider something here. This word endureth here is speaking about the faithfulness of God, is it not? Yes, it is. The faithfulness of God. Everything that, that Israel came through, God was there. God was here at that time. God was here at that time. God was here at that time. He parted the waters. You know, he rained manna from heaven. Everything right on time that they needed. His mercy endureth forever. His faithfulness is enduring forever. And I want you to think about something. He, his faithfulness was there, come what may. You ever found a time in your life that God wasn't faithful? No, you haven't. God has proved His faithfulness. Amen. Still yet, we hold God to His faithfulness. Do we not? Yes, we do. We hold God to His faithfulness. We expect it from Him. Amen? I fall on my knees right now. I don't care what the circumstances are. I fall on my knees. I expect God to be there. 
right? Because he's God. And his mercy and his faithfulness endureth forever. We, we expect faithfulness from God right now, regardless of what he did yesterday. Regardless of what God has done for us in the past, when we need him, we expect him to be here right now. And we expect him to be here tomorrow, come what may. That's true, isn't it? Regardless of yesterday, of what all he's done, we want God and we call God to his faithfulness. Endurance and faithfulness go hand in hand. His mercy endureth forever. What does that mean? He's faithful, he's faithful, he's faithful. You cannot have an enduring God who is not faithful. God's faithful. For one to endure unto the end, uh uh-oh, he must be what? Faithful. what's, What's the Lord saying here? He that endureth to the end, he that is faithful unto the end, the same shall be saved. Endurance and faithfulness go hand in hand. It's easy to be faithful, listen, when all is well. Amen? When there's blue skies, when there's smooth sailing, when there's money in the bank, bills are paid, there's a pep in your step, and everything is hunky-dory. Oh, it's easy to be faithful, right? Sure it is. But you're not enduring anything there, are you? Uh Uh-uh. What are you enduring? Enduring just means there's a different kind of faithfulness. Oh, we, we can be faithful when everything is going our way. Well, we don't have a care in the world. We don't have a need. And it's, good, it's easy to be faithful. What about when the chips are down? What about when there ain't no money in the bank? What about when the storms are raging? Oh, then faithfulness requires endurance. To remain faithful. When the storms rage, when sickness comes, when being tried, when you've lost your job, all the bills are due, your body's sick and afflicted, that's when we must endure to remain faithful. People think that they can live um, a faithful life just a mediocre life. Everything's going okay. I'm, you know. But when hardships come, some people try to continue living the same way. You've got to endure then. It takes more to be faithful. Some people change their thoughts on God's expectations for them according to their situation. Their set of circumstances, their condition, this doesn't change God or the Word of God. I don't care what your circumstances are, whether it's all happy good times or all sorrow. It does not change God and it does not change the Word of God. We must be faithful unto the end. Jesus spoke to Ephesus, uh, the church at Ephesus there in Revelations 2 and 10, Paul vision of the message there at Ephesus. Jesus says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Oh, we, we, we think, you know, we've got promised a crown of life. That comes at the end of this life. That comes... After death, Jesus said, be faithful unto death. No, come what may, no matter how hard the battle is, the Lord said, be faithful unto death. Galatians 6 and 9, Paul says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap If we faint not. Faithfulness is essential 
to your salvation. Amen? Yes, it is. Faithfulness to God is essential to your salvation. Paul said, let's not be weary in well-doing. What's that mean? I don't care how many prayers you pray a day. I don't care how many chapters in the Bible you read, how many homes you visited, how many meals you cooked for the widows this week. That's all well. You're doing well. But if we grow weary in that, God help us. You know works will not get you to heaven alone. Uh Uh-uh. You cannot be saved only by your works. All that you do, don't grow weary in well-doing. If you're doing well, find something more to do. Right? Continue on. Because he says, we shall reap if we faint not. And all this well-doing I'm doing, I get tired. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. You can't afford to faint. You can't afford to grow weary because that's when you're going to fall. The Lord said, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. I hope you're receiving something from this. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. 10 through, uh, 22 through 25. I want to speak to us this morning. But he says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast uh the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. We can't afford to waver in our profession of salvation. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. You believe the Lord requires something of us in faithfulness? Yes, He does. Faithfulness in our walk with Him? Faithfulness to be in the house of God. Do you believe that you growing weary in all of your well-doing can cost you your salvation? Yes, it can. You can't afford to grow weary and faint because you'll lose out with the Lord. Someone said this morning already, it's been quoted, none of us here in this building has heard the pearly gates clank behind us yet. Now, we have the promise of the hope of salvation. Oh, we've been recipients of the free gift of life, eternal life. But Jesus said, He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. If you've got a habit of missing church, check your faithfulness to God. Some people are under the uh, influence of the idea, I don't have to attend church to be saved. The Bible tells us, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. If you've got a habit, do you know a habit can cause you to be lost? <laughs> Most of the time when we talk about habits, we, talk, we think we're talking about this. There's all kinds of habits that can cause you to be lost. You don't have to light a cigarette to have a bad habit. A habit is a regular tendency or practice, a custom, a pattern, a style, a routine, a tradition, a reputation. If you have a reputation of missing church, uh uh-oh, Lord, help us. If you have a tendency or a habit of missing church, if you can get to everywhere else in your life, every appointment that you have, anywhere you want to go, 
If you can be at the job every day, on time, do you think God expects us to be at the house of God? Uh Uh-oh. Do you think that is effective on your salvation? You better believe that it is. Don't believe that you can stay at home and maintain your salvation when the Word of God tells us, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Huh? Huh? Yeah. And so much the more. I mean... Uh, we was preaching a while ago about what Mama taught us years ago. How about today? Oh, we, we talk about the prophecy of the great falling away. We're in the middle of it. The, a great falling away of this nation, this world, from the standard of what so many were taught. People who were taught the old-timey way of holiness and the, the Pentecostal way, It's not the Pentecostal way. It's the Bible way. This has not changed. This has not changed. Check your faithfulness. If you have a problem being at the house of God, if there is a habit in your life that you cannot be at the house of God, 